to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ daniel said to the king nebuchadnezzar that the events occurring would happen until he realized that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. Daniel chapter 4, verse number 25. Welcome to our study of the two smaller books in the major prophets, Daniel, and then we'll also notice a few points from the tears of Jeremiah or Lamentations. Keys to the book of Daniel that help us to understand the book is simply the main point, God rules in the kingdoms of men. This is mentioned in Daniel 4.25. It's reiterated to this ungodly king in Daniel 5 verse 21. And then this same picture is seen in a very picturesque way in the book of Revelation that God's church, the kingdom, it's ruling and reigning today, and it is the most important of all kingdoms. Revelation chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Now, some of the key prophecies that we find in the book of Daniel have to deal with the Lord's church. In chapter 2, this is a key prophecy, and we'll mention more about it in just a moment, but chapter 2 has the key prophecy in that Daniel prophesies that of the four kingdoms that are about to arise, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, and the Roman kingdom, during one of those four kingdoms, God is going to establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. We're going to learn that that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this chapter has the key chapter in the book of Daniel for its prophecy. And of course, the key word is the word rules. God has not been dethroned. God is not dead. He is ruling from on high. And of course, according to Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 4, Jesus is right there at the throne of God, enthroned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19 verses 16 and 17. Now let's take just a moment to think about the prophet Daniel himself. Daniel's name literally means God is my judge. And so here God is seen as ruling as the most powerful of all judges, the final judge who all men must give an account to. Romans 14, 12, the scripture says, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Like Ezekiel, Daniel was taken into captivity, but he was one of the first to be taken away into captivity. In fact, in 606, in the first year of the captivity, Daniel is one of the first to go into captivity with the first wave of God's people. When we think about Daniel, we want to illustrate some of the practical lessons, some living messages. Remember Romans 15:4. Scripture says the things that were written before time, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. As I think about the book of Daniel, and as I hear these wonderful stories of Daniel, of his friends, and of the power of God, what is it that I can use as a, a living message for my life today? First and foremost, we want to realize that Daniel, as a young man, he purposed not to sin or to defile himself. Notice Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8. The scripture says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You know, when you think about the young man Daniel, Daniel had a great sense of moral character to him. Yes, he could have eaten the king's delicacies. Yes, he could have drank the wine, and, and maybe people might have overlooked that because of the circumstances. But Daniel had such high character and such high moral virtue 
that Daniel wasn't going to do that. It's likely that some of these foods and delicacies would have been against the Old Testament Levitical code. And no doubt the wine in and of itself has many problems to go along with it. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Daniel knew those things were not good for people of God. And so Daniel made a choice for purity. Young people, what a practical lesson this is today. How we need more young people who will have the moral virtue and character of Daniel when, when presented with moral problems who will rise to the occasion, who won't get involved in modern moral problems that occur today, whether it be alcohol, which still exists today and which a lot of young people are tempted by. When you find yourself in a situation like that, don't wait till right then to decide what to do. Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel already made up his mind, and thus when the problem arose, it wasn't even a question. Daniel knew ahead of time what he was going to do. Determine you're not going to get involved in things like that. When drugs or sexual immorality, impurity, people using ungodly language, or people dressing immodestly tempt you, You've already made up your mind. Go ahead and decide. This is what God says. This is what the Scripture teaches, and I'm going to purpose in my heart. I'm going to make up my mind ahead of time. I'm not going to let those things be a temptation to me. I've already decided what God wants me to do. A second lesson, and really we want to hone in now on the prophecy that is mentioned in Daniel chapter 2 as we think about living messages one of those is the prophecies that we find in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament look in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 44 the scripture says Daniel speaking before the king and in the days of these kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever now realize that during this time Israel is still the kingdom God is reigning through it. So we're not talking about the kingdom of Israel. God's going to set up a new kingdom. Well, what is that new kingdom? We know that there were four kingdoms that were prophesied to reign, and, and these are seen in the dream and in the image that the king has. Gold, that was the Babylonian Empire. Iron, you've got bronze, you've got partly of you've got silver, you've got bronze, you've got clay and metal mixed. Babylonian. Medo-Persian, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. Well, let's think through this for just a moment. Did God set up a new kingdom during the time of the Babylonian reign? No, God didn't steal through Israel. Israel comes out of captivity, and then the Medo-Persians begin to reign. Does God set up a new kingdom during the time of the, the Medes and the Persians? No, not during that time. Well, what about during the time of the Greek Empire? We all know of the great Greek warrior, Alexander the Great. Did God set up a new kingdom then? No, God's still reigning through Israel. But then we come to that fourth and final kingdom mentioned, the Roman Empire. Did God set up a new kingdom during the Roman Empire? You bet He did. In the time of the Roman Empire, the Bible says in Mark 9, verse 1, Jesus speaking to His disciples and says, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. What is that kingdom? Well, we learn in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he says this, And I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom. What's the kingdom? The kingdom's the church. Is the church in existence? Did it start during the time of that Roman Empire? You bet it did. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, For the very first time, the Lord added to the church daily, those are being saved. Paul said in Colossians 1 verse 13 that God was taking people out of darkness and transferring them into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now, let's make that practical. Understand the prophecy is part of it, but what does the prophecy dictate? That there is a kingdom coming during the time of one of these four 
empires and that that kingdom will never be destroyed. You combine that idea with Revelation 11 verses 14 and 15 of God's eternal kingdom being the church which will one day be taken, ushered back to God, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. And my friend, the most important kingdom in all the world that you could ever be a part of is a part of the Lord's church. How privileged we are to live in the age where the church is a reality and where we can know for sure what is God's kingdom and how to be a part of that kingdom. Let's now turn our attention to another practical lesson in the book of Daniel. And the lesson is very simply this. If God puts us in it, God will take care of us during that. Basically saying that if we face trial and tribulation and difficulty, God, if we're faithful to God, God's not going to abandon us during those times. We learn this from Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to the words of Daniel 3, beginning in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. And so here are these three great faithful men of God, and, and an image has been set up. Anybody who won't worship it, throw them in the fire. What do they say? They say to the king, well, if that's what you think you need to do, go ahead, but I promise you this. God will take care of us and see us through it either way. We believe our God will deliver us from it. And you know the rest of the story. There was one like the Son of Man walking in the fire with them, and they were delivered from that furnace which actually consumed the people who threw them in. But then they say this, but if God doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to worship you. What would have happened if God hadn't delivered them? Oh, greater deliverance would have come. Their lives of faithfulness would have been spent with God for all eternity in heaven. Either way, just as these three friends said, they were going to be winners. God was going to take care of them or they were going to perish through suffering and live with God forever in heaven. How true that is for us today that when we face difficulty, Let's remember to trust God. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, Paul says, except such as is common to men. But God, who is faithful with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear or endure it. Now, that way of escape may mean, as it did for some in the first century, that our life comes to an end. But if it does, how bad is it if a child of God dies and goes to heaven, well, friend, that's surely not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And so God's going to take care of us, and thus we can say, the Lord has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Let's then think about another lesson that we learn from the book of Daniel. And this is a very practical lesson about Daniel as a great man of prayer. I want you to look in Daniel chapter 6, verse number 10. That's Daniel chapter 6. Notice what the Scripture says in verse number 10. The Bible says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom from early days. What do we know about the prophet Daniel? Here we learn the type of man he was again a little later in his life. Daniel... They've told Daniel they're plotting plans against him. They get the king, evil men get this king to sign a decree. And the decree of the Medes and Persians, one of their laws is, when a law is made, it cannot be altered or changed. And so the decree's been signed. Daniel knows. They just signed his death certificate in essence. And so Daniel, even though it might cost him his life, Daniel, three times that day, gets down on his hands and knees and prays to God. As a result, 
consequences occur. The king has to take Daniel and throw him in with the lions, but even the king himself says, I believe your God can deliver you. And you remember what happened the next morning when they opened that lion's den? There was Daniel, alive and well, and even the king gave glory to God. But you know, we learn a very powerful lesson from Daniel about his own prayer life and his deliverance, and it's this. Even if prayer was going to cost Daniel his life, he wasn't going to stop praying. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. James 5, verse 16. The Scripture says we are to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Through prayer we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And, and with prayer we can cast all our cares upon God because He cares for us. And you know, as I think about Daniel and that, that great scene in the lion's den, can you imagine how those lions must have felt in view of Daniel, a great man who's being protected by God, and how God actually saw him through that difficult time because of his faith and trust in the Almighty. Now, Daniel, as a man of prayer, we learn in Daniel 9 verse 4, also offers a prayer of penitence for himself and for the people of Israel. I want you to notice Daniel 9, verse number 4. Scripture says these words concerning Daniel's prayer. The Bible says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and who keep His commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. What do we know about Daniel? Daniel didn't claim perfection. In fact, here he confesses the sin of the people and the sin of himself, maybe, as well, who, or himself as well, because they had been involved in some things that were not right, especially the people of Israel, and as a result, they go away into captivity. Friend, this is something that we all have to face. All of us have sinned. We know that's the case. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Ecclesiastes 7, verses 20 through 26. And so we need to be bold enough to own up to our sin. If we say that we have no sin, the Scripture says we make God a liar and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. For just a moment now, let's turn our attention to that final book in the Major Prophets, a book that is often known as the Tears of Jeremiah or the Book of Lamentations. What's Lamentations all about? If we could break it down into its simplest form. Lamentations is a funeral sermon delivered by Jeremiah over Israel's impending doom and death spiritually. He delivers this heartfelt, sad eulogy in essence over Israel's condition as though he's standing over the grave and the body of a loved one. He delivers this heartfelt eulogy to remind the people just where they're heading and just where they're going if they don't change their ways and turn to God. This book is a book that is, is written in a very graphic language. It's written in Hebrew uh, poetry, which in itself was a, a very uh, emotional language in many ways. And as you think about the book, the key word is the word sorrow. Lamentations 1 verse 12 and Lamentations 1 verse 18, the sorrow of this is seen in great detail. Key verse, I want you to notice Lamentations chapter 3 and verse number 40. This is the key verse, I believe, in the book of Lamentations. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. This is what Lamentations and, and really many of these major prophets are all about. Let's check ourselves out. Let's search and examine our ways. And if something's wrong and we know it is, let's turn back to God. Much like 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, test yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. And so key ideas to test, to examine, to check, and to turn back to God. The key message from Lamentations is, unless men are willing to change their ways and repent, ultimate doom 
is going to be inevitable. Friend, how true that is in a more eternal sense. If people will not change their ways and, and turn to God, eternally speaking, doom and torment awaits people like that. And God doesn't want anybody to be lost, nor do Christians as well. Let's think then about some of the practical verses from the book of Lamentations that teach us the power of God's message of sorrow and sin and, and needing to change one's life. Look in Lamentations chapter 1 and notice the very first verse, Lamentations 1 verse number 1. This, How lonely sits the people, or sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she is who was great among the nations, the princess among the provinces, has become a slave. What do we know about the sorrow of sin? We know that sin enslaves people. This great city that was brimming with people, that was vibrant with excitement, that, that held princesses and kings and, and princes. Where is it today? The princess, she's now become a slave. Look at the enslaving nature of sin. Romans 6, 17 says, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered and being set free from sin, we've now become slaves of righteousness. Look at Lamentations chapter 1, verse 5 and notice how sin allows the enemy to overcome us. Lamentations 1 verse 5, the scripture says of this city, of this princess, her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper for the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her sins or transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. What do we know about the sorrow and heartache of sin? Sin allows the enemy to overtake us. Who is the great enemy? 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. And friend, when I give in to the devil, and when I give in to Satan, sin overcomes me. Sin engulfs me, and I am in captive to its allurement and its damning destruction that it can bring on me. But then I want you to notice this from chapter 1. Sin also brings horrible results. Look at what happened in chapter 1, verse 12 of the book of Lamentations. God says, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Behold and see, if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted in the day of his fierce anger. People weren't really thinking about it. They weren't really stopping considering the, the wrath of God and how God had been the cause of this. And as a result, Jeremiah felt a great heartbreak over that sin that was overcoming his people. And thus, we need to realize sin is something that ought to bring spiritual sorrow to our lives. Let me illustrate that. Look at Lamentations chapter 2 and look at the sorrow sin ought to bring. Lamentations 2 verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, Their heart cried out to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Give your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out at night. At the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord, lift your hands toward Him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. Look at what Israel's facing. Look at what they're going through. And, and, and Jeremiah's plea is, you're right to cry. This is something to be sorrowful about. Your children are starving out there. And it's because of your sin and your iniquity that these things are happening. Friends, sin doesn't just have spiritual consequences. It does have that. But it also has consequences here and now. And so we must realize the best life to live is a life lived serving God. Here's a beautiful passage in the midst of this funeral dirge. Look in Lamentations chapter 3. And even in the midst of this text of sorrow, God gives His people hope. Look at Lamentations 3 verses 22 and 23. The Scripture says, Through the Lord's mercies, 
We are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Here Israel, although this is a, a definitely a sad book, a book of sorrow, showing the ultimate demise of those who live in sin, in the midst of this, the, the, the writer cries out, through God's mercy and through God's compassion, we're not consumed because the Lord's mercy is enduring for all people. Friend, if we're saved, it'll be by the grace and the mercy of our God and how desperately we need that salvation and we need to make sure that we're right with God. And so as we think about Daniel and as we think about Lamentations, both of these books dealing with the sin of Israel and their depravity going into captivity and the sorrow that goes with that, let's realize today that this is a practical book in that those who are living in sin desperately need to be warned of the impending doom. The way of the transgressor is hard, proverb writer says, and ultimately it's hard because it is a life that will end result in eternal torment and agony. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 following, but the good news is this, the God whom we serve and the God of the Bible is a God of compassion and a God of mercy and through His compassion and through His mercy, He wants all men everywhere to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Friend, no matter how bad you've been, no matter how deep in sin you've been caught up in, no matter what you've done, realize if you'll become a Christian, you can have all that washed away. If anyone's in Christ, He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Well, how do we get forgiveness of sin? Once we've heard the Word, believed in Jesus, and repented of sin, made that good confession, the Bible says we can repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Acts 2 verse 38. Saul, who is now Paul, was a murderer in many ways. And yet in Acts 22, 16, Ananias came to him and said, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, in view of what sin will do, we urge you, obey the gospel before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. And to conquer death. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.